Good morning. Um, it's always a privilege to stand in front of you and share the heart of God. Um, I'd like to thank this congregation. You have been part of my journey. It's like coming home to a family after um, war. It's, I'm like a soldier coming home from war. Um, who among you were here last year when we had our prophetic? Amen. Some of you were there. I love the prophetic spirit. You know why? And I was seeing you in that movie, and you actually look like her. And it's so funny because I was watching Moana the day before. So identity it is that I'm going to share to you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for you look at us with an eyes of love and passion. We thank you for your spirit that is in our midst this morning, Lord God, ready to speak to us who we are and how you see us. Father, I pray that you would use my voice to deliver your word. We ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to come upon this place this morning, to break mindsets and to change hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to share to you about our identity in Christ. And you probably have heard a lot of messages about identity. And the Lord is just, just keeps repeating the same thing. You know why? One of the biggest challenges of this generation is identity. ABC News has reported... 58 gender choices in our generation. Could you imagine that? When I was young, we only have two choices, a male and a female. Now there's 58 choices. Years ago, I, I've seen a video on Ripley's Believe It or Not, where a man identified himself as a tiger. So what he did, he had his whole body tattooed with tiger prints. He had his um, teeth chiseled to look like a tiger, and he started to act like a tiger. Why? Because how you identify yourself will determine how you act, how you think, and how you decide. And I believe the Lord want to reiterate who we are in Him so that when the hour of crisis comes, we will not be shaken. Amen? We, we are tagged as the most confused and the most destructed generation. Why? You watch the television, the frame changes every two seconds. So you cannot focus anymore in prayer, in your um, relationship with people. We are so distracted. And one of the biggest challenges now is self-identification. 
I am this, so I will act like this. It's funny, like there's one, this one time I was browsing through the discussion on the internet about um, gender identification. And one of the comments were like, it's like, um, the person is identifying himself as this gender, so who are you to judge? And the guy said, well, I identify myself as a judge. <laughs> funny, right? So clever. But it's true. People can just say, I identify myself as, as this, as that. But what is the Lord saying? It's a matter of perspective for us to see who we really are. When you look at the subtitle of the topic, who do you think you are? If I say it to you like, who do you think you are? <laughs> it's like, I want trouble, right? But if I, say, if I ask you in, in, in this manner, who do you think you are? I'm asking a question. So it's the same thing as our identity. It's a matter of perspective. Who do we think we are? Why? Because as immigrants here in, in Canada or as people from other places, your identity is not your citizenship or your nationality or the culture of your family. Otherwise, you will be so confused. Your identity doesn't come from your achievements or the things that you acquire in life. Otherwise, if it's taken away from you, you'll be shaken. Your identity doesn't come from the mistakes that you committed in the past. Or does it come from what people say about you? Or what people say you are? Because you will end up pleasing people. What is God saying about our identity? 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says here, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into, this, into his marvelous light. We are a special kind of people, peculiar. I heard, I heard Pastor Ron said it like, we are weird. We, doesn't, we, don't, we don't belong in this world. So if you are being persecuted by standing for your conviction, you are standing on who God created you to be. We are different and set apart from this world. And God's kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. If you want to be if you want to be promoted, be humble. If you want to receive, give. It's the other way around. If you want to live, die to yourself. Yeah. So what is our personal identity in Christ? In the Bible, to summarize it, there are three things that God is saying about us. First, we are a child of God, which will be the main focus of my, of my word, of my message today. We are the bride of Christ, and we are, the priest, we are a priest before the Lord. Um, I just want to give you a quick overview about being the bride of Christ before we move into the main topic. Um, the narrative of the story from the garden down to Revelation is about Christ being the bridegroom, his preservation, the preservation of, um, of the uncorrupted seed so that he could marry his bride in the end. And who is that bride? 
It's the church. He is going to marry a bride that is spotless, blameless, and wrinkle-free. And I'm not here, I'm not going to talk about the end times, but I just want to trigger your, um, your minds to be knowledgeable of what is about to happen and what is our participation in the end days, in, in the end times. Um, in Matthew 24, verse 20, it says here, and pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Who believes that what will happen in the end times is already written? It's already um, decreed. There will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. Brothers will fight against brothers. The love of many will grow cold. There will be abomination of desolation. Okay? Don't check out, okay? But God is saying, pray that your flight will not be during the winter. Why? Because the bridegroom is asking for agreement. If you are married here and you are pray, preparing for your wedding, both the bride and the bridegroom agrees on what will happen. Right? So God is waiting for our participation. Pray about what will happen. Pray about the details. Next, we are the priests before the Lord. We are priests before the Lord, and we are called to stand before the Lord in intercession. You know, priests in the, end, in the Old Testament, they come before the Holy of Holies, offering in behalf of the sin of the people. And we are... In the, in the, in the um, new covenant called as priest before the Lord. That's why when you open your television and see, oh, there's wildfire going on in BC, the worst thing you could do is just to um, turn it off and say, wawa aman, <laughs> poor people. Why? Because God is waiting for you, for, for your words. He is listening to your voice. We are here as priests in the earth, in intercession, petitioning before, before God with what's happening all around the world, the bombings, the rumors of war. What are we doing? Amen? So, our challenge, again, I want to I want to focus on us being a child of God. The challenge in our generation right now is we perceive our Heavenly Father. Of course, if you're a child, you have a father based on our perception of our earthly fathers. And we, this generation is perceived as a fatherless generation. Either a lot of fathers are away, working, or they are there, but they are quiet. They are not um, part of their children's lives. And I am here today to challenge the fathers to declare and to speak destiny in the lives of your children, because that's how they will per perceive their heavenly father. Speak destiny. You are the representation of the heavenly father here on earth. You know, God's highest name is father. Because his highest priority is family. He sent his son so that we could be his family. He sent his son to die for us. So I'm going to read today. Our main text is from Romans 8 verses 14 to 28. It says here, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It is so interesting 
that God used fear as the enemy of our identity as child of God. He didn't use sin or lack or infirmity or temptation. He used fear. Because when you are under fear, fear is the enemy of faith. And when you are under fear, it changes you. Who has seen a person who is so fearful? <laughs> you, when, you, um, when you are um, in the theme park or something, you ride uh, the rides, the roller coaster. Have you seen a fear fearful person? <laughs> you know? The person is so strong and so manly, and all of a sudden, the guy is freaking out. <laughs> fear changes us. And the, um, I want to talk to you about the three main fears that our generation is facing. And I, when I talk about this generation, I'm not talking about the young people. We live in this age. We are part of this generation. Okay? First, FOMO, or the fear of missing out. Okay? The fear of missing out. It is defined as a pervasive apprehension that others might be having rewarding experiences from which one is absent. This social angst is, have, uh, um, is ch characterized by a desire to stay continually connected with what others are doing. Okay, this is what social media is doing to us. When you see people, you open your Facebook, you open your Instagram account, and you see people living their dreams, and you have this fear in your heart. I am missing out in life. They're doing this. They're having this. They're having these experiences. And I am just here, working every day, doing the same routine, mundane things. Or might be, I lost my job. I am missing out. I am missing out. Discovering the possibilities and not having it is the root of covetousness. When you are so um, happy about your life, you are happy about your two-bedroom house, and then there was a show house, and you saw the possibilities. Wow, five bedrooms. Wow, this is the new model. And suddenly, you cannot sleep anymore. I should have this. I am missing out. Ouch. But sister, ever, how about faith? Well, you will know it by the fruit. Faith, oh, I need to see it. So my faith would be built up. You will be excited and hopeful. God has promised he will give me this. I am excited. But covetousness, you cannot sleep. I need to have it. My high school friends have them, and I don't. FOMO. Let me ask that. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plan plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God has a blueprint for each and every one of us. And you're, do not compare your blueprint to the blueprint of other people. Why? Because God doesn't love us fairly. God doesn't love us equally. Because if God loves us equally, if you die, then you can just be replaced by someone. You are irreplaceable. 
Your destiny is irreplaceable. Your calling is irreplaceable. God loves us uniquely. So, amen. <laughs> You're hanging, right? Oh, heresy. <laughs> God doesn't love us equally. God loves us uniquely. So if this person is having this blessing, you will have your own that she doesn't have. Be happy with what God is giving you. God is loving you in a unique way. Amen? Second, fear of not being good enough. Okay? We all have the tendency to prove ourselves. And we have this fear that we are not good enough. It's part of the longing of the human heart. And it's not a sin. Okay? It's not a sin to long to be um, to belong. It's not longing to long to be great. God has placed it in our hearts. But if you um, convert it into ways that is of this world, then that becomes a sin. I remember um, last weekend, I think it was a Saturday, we were at Glenmore Park, and Jamie went on a swing, and she's like, she was swinging, and she's like, oh my gosh, this is scary. And there was this boy, this little boy, who heard her. She's, he's like four years old. He came and was like, no, it's not. He, he went on the other swing and he did his exhibition. And it's like, see, it's not scary. It's not scary. <laughs> we are like that. It's like, look at me, look at me, look at me. And when we get old, it is translated to what we call as selfies. Right? If you have an album of 45 pictures every day that you upload on the internet of your selfies, all the angles of your face. It's like you're saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Because we want affirmation. We fear that we are not good enough. We we want to be the big thing, the next big thing. You see someone and you want to be, I want to be like that. For young people, I want to be, um, I want to be Stephen Curry, the next Stephen Curry. I want to be the next Joel Austin or the next Joyce Meyer. Or for the business people, I want to be the next Bill Gates. Let me pop your balloon. There is no next big thing because God is not making the next big thing he is making a new thing yes he is making a new thing out of you amen and so when you fear that you cannot keep up with these people and you are not good enough that is so tiring and you will lose what God is pointing out that you are a child. You have an inheritance. You are a child of God. Let me combat that fear when you say, I am not good enough. Yes, we are not good enough. That's why we need the Lord. It's the Sermon on the Mount thing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. When you are poor in spirit and you know that apart from God, you can do nothing, then you are on the right path. You are hitting it. You are hitting the mark. Next, lastly, the third one, fear of failure. Who want to fail? Nobody wants to fail, right? But we shouldn't be afraid to fail. Because in failure, in our weakness, God makes his grace abound in us. That is not just about us, but it is about him. 
And I believe man has a different definition of success. What is your definition of success, if I may ask, if I may ask you? If um, I, may, I may ask you, how will you say that you are successful? Throw your answers. How will you say that you are successful? How will one person say that he is successful? Probably a happy family, good education for their kids. What else? A high paying job, properties, vacation abroad, pop popularity maybe. How will you say that you are successful? even hard to define what success is. See, sometimes we define our success based on our assignments in life. You're as, you, are, you, are, you are called to be an engineer or a doctor or a business person. Once what you're doing is um, bearing fruit, you call yourself successful. But that is different from our calling in life. Our calling in life is the same. It is to love God and to love people. And if you summarize the whole Bible, it is just that. Love God, love your neighbor. Love God, love people. And in your assignment, no matter where you are, if you're in an office or if you're home, taking care of your kids, if you are loving God through that assignment and you know that God loves you and I love God, therefore, I am successful. What I'm doing doesn't define me. What I have doesn't define me. It is a blood type. Success is a blood type. And it is the blood of Jesus who has won the victory for each and every one of us. Amen. Um, what is the revelation of our identity in Christ? I consider, verses 18 to 19, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. That, that uh, where am I? <laughs> comparing to the glory that will be re revealed in us. For the creation awaits in eager ex ex expectation for the children of God to be revealed. There is a groaning happening right now. And it is for you and me to be revealed as sons of righteousness, as people carrying the torch, carrying the light of the Lord in this broken world. When the dark gets darker, the light should get lighter. And we are carrying that. There is a groan. Jesus himself is groaning for us as our intercessor. And he's like, may they get it. No matter what's going on around them, may they get it. Who they are in me. And only Jesus can reveal who we are. When the world is telling you this and that, who you should be, are you familiar with the term cyber cutting? There is, you know what cutting is. You cut yourself to hurt yourself. There is a um, term called cyber cutting where you look on the internet and, and you compare yourself with other people. Oh, did I am kind of um, into, into social media. But when you try to, it's okay to appreciate but when you um, compare yourself with these people and you feel um, inferior because they are having this lifestyle 
Oh, beautiful hair. But me? Eh? Oh, this lady's so fit. And I am, uh, you know, that's called cyber cutting. Only Jesus, only God can tell you how beautiful you are. A lot of times, especially for young girls, if they don't hear that they are beautiful at home, the first guy that they encounter that tells them they're beautiful, they're into them because they don't hear it at home. But you know what? If we are already adults and we never heard it at home, there is a person that looks at us and sees us as beautiful. We are so beautiful before him. No matter what you've been through in life, no matter what mistakes you have committed in the past, you are beautiful in the sight of the Lord. There is a scripture in Song of Songs that says, I am dark but lovely. I am poor but beautiful. That's how... Um, the lover looks at the Shunammite, Shunammite woman. And sometimes I say it as, I am dork, but lovely. <laughs> we commit mistakes, you know? But God, God's um, view of us doesn't change. He looks at us as beautiful. So we groan. We groan when we don't get the full potential. As People of this place, as watchmen on this place, I believe I, I, I cannot overemphasize that we are intercessors of this place. Sorry, I'm from the house of prayer, so I, <laughs> I keep repeating the same thing. We stand in the gap. We groan. You don't just look at yourself. We are not the center of this universe. Less, yes, you lost your job, but have you ever prayed for a person who lost his job that doesn't have the Lord? For all you know, the guy is already holding his gun and about to pull the trigger because he is hopeless. You are not sure whether you can enroll in school this semester or not. Why don't you pray for, for young people who doesn't have directions in life? We, we need to start thinking outward than looking at our, ourselves or what we are going through. We groan. That is part of who we are. We groan for this world. Romans 8.28, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So no matter if all the odds are against you to live the best life that you've been dreaming, we know that the end of the story is always good. This is always a happy ending because you are a child of the Most High. Your fights are not just your fights. Your battles are not just your battles. Your battle represents people that you will touch through your testimony. So do not give up what, whatever you are going through right now or how you perceive yourself. It's time to change how we see ourselves. If we look at our Bibles and we see promises upon promises and it doesn't happen, and you start to question, does God really love me? Am I really a child of God? That reveals what, the heart, what your heart's content is. You know, God often offends the mind to reveal the heart. When your mind is offended, why? God said one thing and what's happening is otherwise, it reveals the content of your heart. And I believe that as God's children, as earthly father, 
You know how we are more concerned about the characters of our kids than their comfort? God is the same. He's more of our characters than our comfort. But the, the, the end is always glorious. The end of this is glorious. Hebrews 2, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the scene that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. May I invite the worship team to come up stage? And can we all rise? You know... God is for you. He is not against you. And it says here, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, your life, your struggle, your race, there are witnesses watching over you, cheering for you. There's Paul telling you, hey, do not give up. I've been to sh shipwreck. I've been to prison. I've been to hunger. I've been to a point of death, but I didn't give up. Moses is cheering for you, saying, Do not give up. I spent 40 years in the wilderness just for one mission to bring Israel out of captivity. Abraham is saying, Do not give up on your children. I waited for years for this inheritance. Do not give up on them. The patriarchs are cheering for you. What battle are you facing right now? You are a child of God. There's no need to fear. There's no need to fear. And as we sing this song one more time, if you are facing fears in your life right now, you don't know how to face tomorrow, you don't know what the future holds, God is saying, I am already there. And if you look at the hindsight of your life, when have I been unfaithful to you, God said. If you look at the hardest time in your life in the past, God has pulled you through. He who has been faithful in the past will be faithful till the end. So, Father, we ask that you will silence the foe and the avenger, the accusation of the enemy. That we have been abandoned, that we have been forgotten, or that things will go worse. Father, we ask that you will silence the fear with your love, and that you would just come And whisper who we really are before you, God. That you are our Father and you are for us. And this too shall pass. And it will create a testimony that will give you glory. All for your name.